Well, look, there's concern about Pakistan's economic situation for a number of months now. And obviously, the delay in terms of the IMF talks and where things are is adding to that concern, which is why the CDS is going up. But to use that as a metric to say Pakistan is more likely to default because the CDS has gone up uh, is, is ignoring a few things. Uh, the first and most important among them being that the Sukuk payment that is coming up in December um, that is nearing or trading at near par value. Um, so the market expects that that payment will be made. Um, and then secondly, if you look at the state bank's reserves, which are not super high, they're around $8 billion, um, but that is still sufficient to make that payment. Um, so yes, there are medium term or even near term risks to the economy, but the spike in the CDS does not mean uh, that Pakistan is closer to default than it was perhaps two days ago when the CDS was not as high as it is today, for example. Yeah, so CDS is essentially their spreads. What this means is okay, what will be the cost to ensure a uh, default by a particular country. So again, you know, there are buyers and sellers in the market for this particular CDS. It's an instrument. There are no buyers and there are no sellers. So even if someone comes and just buys something very small, suddenly the price changes and everything just goes Mm, haywire. So it doesn't really represent the true picture and a lot of it is being, it, there is a lot of overreaction than anything else. Also, it's not a probability of default, it's actually credit default swap spread. On the basis of this, you can calculate the probability of default. So there's a lot of issue with how people actually interpret the number and how people essentially uh let's even talk about it like at this cds spread essentially means your probability of default is 100 percent you should have gone into default yesterday but that did not happen it may not even happen one week later when the instrument is due the next due date is april 24 so there's a lot of nuance here and uh sadly since everything is politicized there isn't much uh, discourse that can go on without any uh, with, with, with more rationality I mean, look, uh, from my perspective, there are, have been issues in terms of talking uh, and agreeing with the IMF in terms of what the next steps will be related to what has been agreed upon with the IMF. Now, the government's view is that there have been devastating floods. There is no denying it. Amar and I have been estimating the losses from the very onset of the catastrophe. Um, but it has also been clear that the government has tried to find a way to overestimate these losses in order to get more fiscal space uh, in the run-up to elections. And the IMF is calling out uh, the government on that. Um, so the argument from the IMF side, which to me at least makes sense, is that yes, if you want to spend more money on rehabilitation and reconstruction related to the floods, um, that that's fine. But that does not mean that you ignore some of the uh, other conditions, for example, reforms on the energy sector side, uh, reforms on the taxation side, on the retailer side, which this government reversed after a tweet by Mariam Nawaz, or, or even taxes on the real estate side. Um, so that is where, in my opinion, the the divide is. Um, and the divide is totally fair in terms of the IMF saying, look, uh, the floods do not mean uh, that you are unable to do some of the other things that you have committed to and you better act or we're going to have a problem down the road. Yep, this is precisely what happened and we don't want to increase taxes, we don't want to reduce expenses, whatever I missed there. We continue to run physical, uh, fiscal deficits and then we expect the IMF to agree to it. This is not how things work or things should work. We should be increasing taxes and decreasing, rev uh, decreasing expenses. As simple as that, if you're not going to do it, nothing is going to change. It's pretty simple like that. See, ban is not the solution here. You cannot ban anything, everything forever. Uh, you cannot ban today and then just keep just letting it ban, stay banned for like two years. It doesn't work that way. What's important is to ensure that the PKR finds a fair price. You keep it, let the imports open, let PKR find its value. We don't really want the currency to depreciate because it's a political tool. So we keep it pegged at 220 instead of its fair value, but should probably be around 245 or 250 right now. Uh, the moment imports open up, the moment actual payments are allowed, snap, the PKR is going to depreciate, there will be a hit, but eventually things will balance out. Till the time we do not let the PKR do its thing, the let, we do not let the PKR depreciate, such things will continue, whether that's import bans, whether there are payments bans and so on. Right now, there are a lot of payments which cannot leave the country. Uh, this is a serious issue. Like, there are investors out there, they have to make dividend payments, they cannot take it out. Someone who sold their asset two years back, only they are allowed to make their payment right now. 
so why will anyone invest in the country when they know they can't really take their dollars out of the country so we don't really think about these things we just look at this one stupid number of pkr usd parity and just be happy stay happy about it yeah and i'll add to this like it, it is a growing problem and has been a problem historically right like us companies pakistani policy makers love to come to washington and say invest in pakistan or oh, your companies like coca cola and others are doing so well in our country you should come too but then when you scratch beneath the surface you realize that even payments of 20 25000 are stuck in the state bank uh, just because of what amar just described um so this obsession with a uh, value of a currency with isagdar saying it will go down to below 200 it's now stuck at 220 and making that as a measure of success of economic policy making um is simply disastrous uh, it is stupid as amar said um and 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 is asinine as an approach in terms of governing a country of 22 23 crore people uh that is nuclear harm that economy needs a lot of dynamic uh, investment in uh, but people at the very top are obsessed with a number which is basically supply and demand dynamics of a currency it's it's just ridiculous well there is a way out um and the way out is not rocket science look there are many countries in the world that have faced economic crises that have defaulted and come out of it um india in the early 90s had to put its gold uh, as collateral in order to get an imf program but they made a decision not to do that again because their elites and their policy makers found it uh, disrespectful to be in that position and and they were hurt by it so they decided never again uh, pakistanis need to make a decision as well how many times is pakistan going to keep going back to the imf or go with a begging bowl to riyadh or beijing or doha uh, to get bailouts um 17 and a half billion dollars a year are given according to the undp to elites in pakistan as handouts uh, clearly uh, that's more than enough money in the country to redistribute uh, and to do the reforms that are needed now if if the reforms are politically costly um and cannot be passed when well, then it's a political conversation to be had about why is it politically costly but the fact of the matter is that the economic solution is not rocket science and there is an easy way out of this it's not super complicated it requires political will and statesmanship uh, i mean this is correct basically we have to reduce as i said earlier we have to reduce expenses we have to increase revenue no one wants to reduce expenses no one wants to increase revenue till the time we fix this basic equation we cannot get out of this quagmire we we need to solve our problems we need to fix our problems no one else is going to do it we cannot blame the world we cannot blame outside factors all the time again it's simple increase revenue increase taxes tax people who are not giving tax a tax agriculture tax services tax so many other things that are not tax property that tax so many other things that are not being taxed right now reduce expenses the the, the the size of the government machinery is massive the kind of money that we're spending on random stuff is insane so i mean there's a lot of things that can be done but someone doesn't want to do it they don't want to do it so eventually we will keep running deficits that's that will lead to uh, pressure on the pkr the pkr will continue depreciating and we will keep ourselves alive on borrowed money till the time there are borrowed money available the moment people stop giving us punch to live with and, uh, and it will be a disaster that and no other you know, we haven't really seen that one yet the political will is not there the political conversation the discourse to fix things is simply not there so i don't think we're getting out of this anytime soon yeah i'm as pessimistic as amar and i'll just give your listeners a little bit of data the city of pune in india raises more in property taxes than the entire province of sindh um there are mid tier cities in india that raise more in property taxes than the entire province of punjab uh so if you don't want to tax real estate because it is uh politically costly um you're not getting out of this quagmire it's as simple as that